Vodafone reports a trading update for the third quarter on Friday. It follows first half loss of 7.8 billion euros as the company took a hit from the disposal of its Indian operations. How does this leave Vodafone as mobile communications begin to approach 5G mobile services? A very expensive process. Also, can Vodafone continue with its 9% dividend? Telecoms analyst uh, Christopher Nicholson joins us now from Orica. Christopher, Vodafone's new chief executive, Nick Reid, seemed to have a tough job on his hands facing 5G costs when cash is down at the company while wanting to satisfy long-term investors that want to see for these fantastic yields continuing. Uh, what's going on at Vodafone? Good morning, Jeremy. Uh, I think um, you're absolutely right about that. It is tough. Um, and our, our view on it, I think it might be a little bit different. Um, Essentially, Vodafone is facing not just the 5G uh, rollout challenge, um, but it is also facing a very significant transaction in the German market. Uh, it's in an environment where it is very difficult to grow revenues, and the story is really continuing rounds of cost cutting. And of course, you've got a change to new guard coming in with Nick and Margarita and, uh, and Gerard to some extent, uh, Chrysalis. Um, now, the, what we really think is going on is that the market is, is looking at uh, Vodafone, looking at the deal and looking at a great deal of uncertainty and a new management team, which replaces one that had you know, 10 to 20 years experience, depending on how you uh, want to uh, qualify that. Um, the, the real issue here, we think, is the uh, Germany deal. And the problem is that, that Vodafone have made a, uh, a very big uh, gamble on this. If they can succeed, then arguably they, they do return to growth and they become a very significant player. But the problem is they're up against Deutsche Telekom in their home market. And for Deutsche Telekom, the failure of this deal would be a much more important outcome uh, than the success of it for Vodafone. So it's, Deutsche Telekom has the most to lose. And Deutsche Telekom historically has been very, very defensive about its home market. Um, the other issue there is that it isn't just a commercial deal because now it's going to the regulator. There's a lot of politics involved and there's a lot of long-term strategic thinking behind any political decisions that, that might be made. I mean, we think it is unlikely that this deal will actually get through. And the reason is that the German government still owns more than 30% of Deutsche Telekom. Uh, if um, the union were to show at this point that the UK was able to wave around successes um, as part of uh, um, post-Brexit, that in the end, is the kind of thing that union cannot afford to happen. Over and above that, Germany's backup plan, if the union were ever to disintegrate, would clearly to be housed national cham champions, just as any countries would in that situation. And from their point of view, they would very much want a strong and dominant Deutsche Telekom in the six countries where they may have, the, shall we say, the closest economic relationships should the union unwind at some point. So there's a lot of long-term strategic thinking going on in the background, we believe. And that means there's going to be a huge amount of inertia and a great deal of interest from powerful parties to try and ensure that the Vodafone Germany uh, cable deal with Liberty Global does not actually get regulatory clearance. Clearly, there's a lot uh, going on there in the German markets. That's an operational issue. Uh, going back to the balance sheet and uh, this big loss that they had from selling the Indian business, um, tied in, of course, to the costs they're going to face with 5G. Um, I know that um, Vodafone, uh, with its joint venture partner, O2, are discussing selling the mast business. How important is it for Vodafone to get cash coming into the business at a time when it's facing all these potential costs? Yes, Jeremy, and again, we, we, I think that is a very interesting question. And what we see with the mask business, so there are two sides to this. One is Vodafone floating uh, an idea that may be a backup plan if the German deal does not go through, so that it can say, well, we have another way of raising cash in the short to midterm, which is selling off the mask business. 
We'd ask a question, which is, is it really a great strategic idea to sell off the mass businesses? Because historically, telecoms companies have done that when they've had too much debt and they've been under pressure. So, yes, it's an asset. The private ex equity companies have been interested in buying these mass assets. They wouldn't do that for no reason. If they can get a lower price, all well and good. You have at least three major sellers in the European market at the moment. And whether or not they would achieve 12 billion at this point, which is a number that has been put out there by one of the investment banks, I think is probably open to closer examination. It may be worth 12 billion, but they're really entering, in our view anyway, into a buyer's market so that their ability to get that sort of level might be quite a challenge. You mentioned uh, a lot going on in Germany, of course. Germany is one of um, these four biggest markets in, in Europe, at least, that uh, Vodafone has got, UK, Spain and Italy, the other three. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Vodafone recently bought Liberty Global European Cable TV operations. In, in retrospect, was that a, a good deal or do you think that that's now saddled them with an extra element of complication uh, when the company is, as you say, facing um, a lot of hurdles within the European markets, not least of which, of course, doubtless is going to be Brexit, uh, but also uh, this, this content side of the business. I, is there almost too much now for the company to face? I think if you're coming on, I mean, it, it's not that Nick is new to the company, of course, of course. but he's new to the CEO role. Um, there'll be an element of having inherited a strategy, elements of which naturally he will have a different view on, as you might hope or expect. And so there could well be uh, a juggle between uh, what he wants to do strategically with the company as opposed to what Vittorio Colau was doing with the company. So that could be the case. But I think, in essence, they made the right move to try and get those German assets. I just don't think there's a high probability in the end of them getting signed off, and the backup will be to sell off more assets. So what you're facing is a lot of risk, a lot of complication, and eventually no further growth outcome if they don't win the, if they don't win the German deal, you know, if they don't win the regulatory element of the German deal. So you're selling off then another asset where does revenue growth go and how long can that go on for? It feels like a company, just as we speak, it feels like a company that has the perception that it's still in retreat. Yeah. Um, I want to move on to the dividend, if I can. And uh, when looking at this particular question, let's bring up a share price chart, uh, which shows that the company was back at, what, £2.60 back on the 9th of June yeah. 2015. Here we are now, Diana, all at one. one pound 45 uh, not too far away yeah. from the next line of support down at 126.75 part of this has brought about this amazing dividend that's coming if you buy shares at these levels you're buying a dividend of nine percent return which is phenomenal in the market of course a long-term dividend shareholder um, a shareholder would actually have seen a big reduction in its overall value of the shares because of this pullback in the share price um, but mm. can the company seriously at these levels continue this nine percent yield I don't think any company would really want to be strapped at 9% yield, any company of the scale of Vodafone, because you would be buying that stock because the dividend would be fairly guaranteed, so you would be happy to take a lower yield. That would be the thinking for institutional shareholders in part. With the reduction in the price, you know, you get this, uh, the yield rising to 9%, but there's, there's no, I don't think there is cash there to, to support something like a 10% yield at a £2.50 price. Um, so inevitably that year will fall back. If you bought now in time for dividend washing, etc., then yes, it might work. But again, if the company falls to say, if the share price falls to say one pound fifteen, one pound ten, I think that the direction of travel would change sharply because that over a 20, 30 year period has been uh, a very solid support line for Vodafone shares, and the company is not smaller than it was. Uh, 20 years ago, you know, it is still a bigger company. Do you think the risk is then downside to here, or do you think in terms of the valuation ranges, you're looking potentially at uh, a company that's maybe undervalued at these levels, at these sort of uh, valuation ranges at the moment, around about 145? Do you think that fairly represents the business as it's presented to shareholders? Well, I think you've got, I mean, the problem they face, of course, although we're not technical analysts, anybody can see that the problem they face is that they have got very strong downward momentum. Uh, it will be interesting to see how the market interprets, interprets any negative signs on the German deal, on the Liberty Media deal. My feeling about that is that that will push the share price down further 
because it really means that investors have to look at Vodafone in terms of what short-term cash can it raise and how much debt can it pay down. That will come down to the mass sales. And as we have discussed, I'm not convinced that in a buyer's market they would get the $12 billion that they're hoping for. They might have to do a lot less. And then, of course, they've got one asset less. Or if you talk about European masks, you know, they've got, they've got those masks as well. But in the end, they run out of assets they can sell mm. while still having a cogent business case about being a global operator. Difficult times uh, for Nick Reed and his team. Yeah. Uh, look, Christopher, we'll have to leave it there. But thank you so much indeed for joining us.